Now, although the methods of um, behaviorism uh, are really alive and well in today's um, psychological and neural science, just for a couple examples, it is, it is quite routine in behavioral neuroscience uh, to employ classical conditioning and operant conditioning uh, to study the human brain. Uh, it is fairly routine in clinical psychology to use classical conditioning uh, in order to try to help people um, um, get over phobia. Uh, and you can go on Amazon right now and buy a book that will teach you how to use classical and, and operant conditioning to train your dog or train your boyfriend or train your girlfriend. Uh, there's a big industry for the latter two. Um, Nonetheless, uh, somewhere close to the 50s, um, behaviorism suffered some fatal blows. Uh, and that was the ultimately the demise of behaviorism. Now, the first and particularly uh, ardent critic of behaviorism was Noam Chomsky, uh, now very famous uh, linguist. Now, um, uh, Chomsky, uh, who was very critical of behaviorism. And then, as I said earlier, he thought that defining psychology as the science of behavior was much like defining, uh, defining physics as the science of reading a meter uh, without really understanding or, or caring to understand for what are the underlying forces that lead to those readings on a meter. So with no care for the brain and the mind. Um, but Chomsky realized the um, realized the, the the crucial problem uh, with uh, behaviorism was that it could not account for aspects of the human mind that are generative and creative. Um, in the sense, Chomsky argued that behaviorism, for example, could never fully explain. The, the richness, the creativity, the generativity, and in fact, the infinity of certain behaviors, such as language. Remember, uh, we already saw that Deschartes realized that there's something creative, and so there's something generative uh, of human language. We often come up with new sentences all of a sudden that we've never said before. Okay? We do that all the time. Um, and not only we do that, we can also understand sentences we've never heard before with relative ease. In fact, Chomsky gives the example of a, of a child who gets upset. Maybe um, uh, he didn't receive something he wanted. And so he looks at his mother and says, I hate you, mommy. No way this child was ever rewarded for saying something like that, which would be the behaviorist approach. The behaviorist approach would be that the language you speak is nothing but the collection of sentences you've learned, you've, you've got rewarded for, and so you learned work. Now, you would then have to accept that somehow this child used the sentence and got rewarded for it, and, and therefore has the sentence as part of um, his or her um, uh, language. But of course, this cannot explain, again, the richness and the generativity and the infinity of language. For that, you need to go back to some kind of internal machinery, internal mental representation that allows you to forge new sentences with perfectly good meanings, and that allows you to receive new sentences and fully understand. Um, and indeed, this was the beginning of a revolution, not only in psychology, but also in linguistics. Uh, now, just about at the second time, a big blow came from an actual behaviorist researcher, uh, Edward Tolman. Now, he was interested, uh, he was studying rats and, and how they selected the trajectories within environments. And his experiment went something like this. He would put a rat, he would start by putting a rat uh, at one end of a maze, always the same. And the rat would freely explore the maze and go in every arm and explore it all at will. Uh, 
with no uh, with no reward. So there was no reward here. The rat just kind of walked around and visited the maze as much as it wanted. Then a food reward would be placed into the maze. Um, and uh, let's say here. And of course, the rat doesn't know that. So it kind of moves around and then suddenly will bump into the food. And then you repeat this. You put the rat back at the starting position, always the same. And now the rat learns that if it wants food, it always has to turn right at this particular crossing. And you keep doing this so that you ensure that the rat has learned that in order to find the food, it has to turn right. And here is the interesting part. What Pullman did is he took the rat and he put it as a starting position at the opposite end of the maze. And see, this is really interesting because the question is, what direction is the rat going to turn? If you are a behaviorist, if, if all that the rat has learned is the behavior of turning to the right in order to get its food, right? Because every time he was in this position, he'd had to turn right to get the food. If the rat is here, then if all it learned is a behavior, it would come down here and then turn right and go in the opposite direction than the food. Turns out what the animals do is that they actually turn left and go to the food. Not only, interestingly, if, if a rat had done the same, the same training, but without first having the freedom to explore the maze, it wouldn't be able to do it. Only the rats that first had the ability and the time to explore the maze did, uh, when they were put in this circumstance, go straight to the food. Um, so this is interesting because this must mean that the rat must have formed some kind of internal map, some kind of cognitive map of the maze, and it must have formed it during the initial exploration when there was no reward. And thanks to that map it could develop as it just roamed around, it could go straight to the food despite being in a new position. See, the behavioral approach cannot account for this flexibility in generating novel behavior, just like language. This type of intelligent, novel, adaptive behavior cannot be explained in terms of the animal having learned purely a behavior. Something inside of the black box must have changed. Now, also the second aspect um, the second cardinal aspect of behaviorism is actually problematic. The idea that we come into this world, tabula rasa, uh, a blank slate, and, uh, uh, and we learn everything. It turns out there's a lot of evidence for the idea that we come into this world with um, substantial innate knowledge. I mean, for one, even if you're a behaviorist, you have to come into this world with inside your mind the mechanisms to learn, the mechanisms for, um, um, for operant conditioning and classical conditioning to the very least. But if you think of it, there's plenty of things that you can do that you didn't learn to do, you just did. You didn't learn to see and to recognize objects for what they are, it just happened to you. The same is true for language, at least for your native language. You didn't really study it in the sense you didn't go through a book of rules and, and kind of learn them all by heart until you became proficient at using them. You just picked it up. Your brain did all of that for you. So in the sense, there's, there's clearly a lot of knowledge that is not learned, but that is probably embedded into the brain itself. Second, it turns out but not everything can be learned, meaning not all associations can be learned equally. Uh, if you believe behaviorism, you could take any two random things and pair them up and get somebody to learn them easily. Turns out some associations are easier to learn than others. Some turn out to be entirely impossible, at least in animal models. For example, 
uh, if you placed a rat in a Skinner box and you first had it uh, eat some food and then later on uh, you, you induced nausea in the animal, it would learn the association between the food and nausea. And, and from then on, it would try to avoid that particular food. Imagine a slightly different setup. Say that you had an animal eat some food, and then you expose it to electrical shock. The animal here does not learn any association. It does not learn to avoid food in order not to get an electrical shock. As I said earlier, it does learn to avoid food in order not to feel nauseous. So see, um, there is something special here between certain associations, for example, between food and then fe feeling nauseous. It makes sense. Um, but the animal doesn't seem to be able to learn other arbitrary associations that maybe are not as plausible in the animal's environment. See, this is another example of how our minds come into this world with guiding principles and biases that guide us towards learning certain associations which make sense in our environment and serve us and prevent us from making other associations that don't quite serve us in the same way.